the miracles only occur in the present moment, whether it's this one or this one or this one, and really starting to trust that you are the wise one. Do not outsource your happiness. Do not outsource your wisdom. Do not outsource your personal power. You are the one. And that includes that power of your attention. Do not give it away to what is not worthy. Hey everyone, it's Vasavi Kumar, licensed therapist and your host of the Being Human with Vasavi podcast. For over two decades, I have been relentless when it comes to understanding and figuring out why we think the way we do, what stops us from going after our dreams, and how to get anything we want in life. From Mind Body Green to VH1 to Fox News and some of the top rated podcasts out there, my message has always been consistent. When you know yourself, you can do anything. I've helped thousands of people from all walks of life, from stay-at-home moms to entrepreneurs to people in recovery to start thinking differently and change themselves from the inside out. And I'm going to do the same for you. Whether it's through the interviews I have with my guests or answering your questions right here on the show, here's my promise to you. If you're willing to take action on even 1% of what you hear today, your life will be unrecognizable. Get ready for unfiltered and unscripted conversations with some of the brightest people in mental health, marketing, relationships, and business. We're pulling back the curtain so you can see what it really takes to be human and become the person you want to be here on the Being Human with Basavi podcast. What can I say about Sarah McLean? Um, she is a sparkly individual. And here's what I mean by that. We did this interview on video, uh, which you can find over on my YouTube channel as well, if you're a visual person. But just when you hear her speak, there is something, she is so present. She is so present. And she, when she just shows up, you just feel lit up because that's what 25 years of meditation will do for you. She is, she is just a beautiful, beautiful person. And, and I think really the one word that comes to mind is she has this attention that she gives people where you just feel really seen. And if you listen to the whole interview, you'll, 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 you're going to get a lot from it. I mean, we talk about relationships. We talk about owning your gifts, not giving away your power. And um, just a little bit about her. Sarah McLean is the best-selling Hay House author of Soul Centered. Transform your life in eight weeks with meditation and the power of attention, awaken to love, and its unlimited potential with meditation. She has spent much of her life seeking and teaching peace, and she began working with Deepak Chopra back in the 90s, and that's what she fell in love with, meditation and mind-body health. So for over 23 years, she's been teaching meditation and mindfulness. Her personal mission is to support those who seek fulfilling lives, better health, inner peace, and ways to manage their stress through the program she has created through her institute, the McLean Meditation Institute in Sedona, Arizona, which I've actually been there personally. She's dedicated to helping people wake up to the wonder and beauty of their own lives and the world around them. So if you've ever said to yourself, I can't meditate, it's too hard, I have too many thoughts, you've got to listen to this episode because she's going to break it down. She's going to break it down and you're going to walk away being like, you know what? It's not about being perfect, right? It's any, but she's, she specifically says, and I don't want to clue you in too much because I want you to listen to the full episode, but she goes, you can't fail at meditation. So go ahead and listen to this episode, sit back, enjoy, and um, just, just soak it all in. Sarah, I am so, it's like, it's such a beautiful feeling to be talking to you because I remember the first time I met you. I've met you twice in person. First time was in Sedona. We went, to, we went to the McLean Meditation Center, my sister and I, we went for a meditation retreat. Second time I saw you was at the Celebrate Your Life conference, I believe in Chicago. And uh, I was actually telling my dad yesterday, I'm like, I'm interviewing Sarah McLean. And my dad was like, meditation? I was like, yes, meditation. And he's like, oh my he goodness. Like, that's, how, that's how he remembers you. You know, and um, that's how I remember you too. But I know that you got a lot of new stuff maybe that you're putting out into the world. And I think the one thing that I really kind of want to uh, highlight in this is just how you have used your own mindfulness practice to really uh, serve the world on a, on a greater capacity. So can you tell us a little bit about what's going on right now with you? Right now, what's going on? Well, I, last uh, year or two, I moved about five times. I actually moved from Sedona to a couple of different spots before I ended up where I am now, which is heaven on earth, which uh, it's in the Santa Barbara County area. 
Oh. And I get to, in the very far distance, I get to see the ocean where I get to go every day. It's a great spot. And I, I'm finding myself rescuing a lot of seabirds. Mm. Um, and so that's, and I'm fortunate because right by my house is a wildlife center, which takes care of the injured seabirds. So I'm finding that to be extremely fulfilling. If I'm not picking up trash on the beach, I'm rescuing those animals. Today, I left one there because it had so much life force, I thought they might make it. Anyway, um, but in terms of meditation, you know, I, I've been teaching meditation since 1993. And then around 2000, and, what was it, 2012, I started my Meditation Teacher Academy. And that is an academy where people come, although now they're not coming because nobody can come yet. But right. they've been coming um, to learn how to become meditation teachers. It's a distance learning program followed by an intensive for eight days. And over 350 people around the world have gone through this program and they've all gone off to put their own personal spin on how they bring meditation into the world. Everybody's different, whether they're public speakers or writing books or getting their podcast together or doing meditations online. So what's happened for me is I kind of was in that little world of teaching teachers and really just hibernating in terms of my own outreach publicly. And what's happened lately is um, I've come out of the closet and I'm on Zoom leading meditations. I was leading four a day as we got the first announcement for COVID. And I didn't really want to, but one of my friends is a newscaster in Las Vegas and he's won a number of Emmys and he calls me up. He's also one of our teachers. He says, you gotta get online, you gotta help people. And um, I was like, okay, because I don't know, it's hard to come out of the closet, right? It's hard to get out here and you know, have everybody see you every single day on Zoom live and sort of unpolished. And, and so I was doing that, I'm still doing it, but now I've got some of my teachers doing it every day with me. So I do it once a week now and though it's going on daily. And um, I'm finding that people, well, there's a few ways to navigate what's going on with, with COVID. Uh, one is recognizing the life we've already created for ourselves personally, not necessarily as a global, uh, a gro a global impact, but as personal, um, as people, what have we surrounded ourselves with? What is our personal experience in our day you know, where is our sanctuary? You know, is it in your room? Is it outside? Is it in your heart? Is it through meditation? Is it through prayer? So really appreciating the life sort of in that musical chairs experience where the music stopped and you find yourself right where you are with the people you've sort of chosen to be with. And then uh, secondly, being grateful, you know, uh, being grateful for what's what we have and what who we are and who's around us. And then uh, being compassionate because there's so many people that don't have um, a decent spiritual life. You know, they don't have, they don't know how to be alone with themselves. I think it was Franz Kafka who said, you know, man's greatest struggle is being alone with himself in a room. And that's what a lot of people are finding themselves dealing with right now. And, and so having compassion for them and reaching out and creating community like you're doing right here on this podcast. And then uh, third, really being um, present as much as possible in everyday interactions. You know, I mean, I can be checked out. I was a little checked out when you called because I was writing a post about uh, what's going on in the world besides COVID, um, which I think everybody should move to the prefrontal cortex of their brain and move out of the fight or flight response and check out what else is going on instead of walking around in this masked fear-based uh, existence. I love the word, first of all, it's okay I, because I knew that you were just finishing up something. So like, it, it's not a big deal. I think acknowledging it though, like, Hey, I'm not present right now. I'm doing this. Like that's really all it is. And you did that. So it's like, I, I don't, I, I, uh, I don't get offended easily. Like I used to, because I'm like, it's nothing personal. You're, and you're not offending me. Like I, I don't like to be highly offended by things because that robs me of my peace, you know? So, um, I love that you are obviously taking your work. You've had to, go a little bit more online now because of everything going on. And, uh, you know, since we're recording this right now during COVID time, it, it, are you finding that the people that you're leading in meditation, the biggest struggle that they have is to sit with themselves and be alone? Well, the people I'm meeting don't find that to be the big struggle because they're reaching out. So they're really ready. But I have so many, uh, so many comments in the chat sections of Zoom, you know, that are saying, I've been wanting to meditate my entire life and now I'm finally getting a chance to do it. I'm committing to do this. It's the one thing that I live for. Um, I love connecting in this community because 
I feel like I've got an appointment, you know, with myself and you every day. And I really feel like some people are adopting this as a mode of survival to uh, literally counterbalance the fight or flight response with the uh, parasympathetic response and to, to move away from the fear. Because if you're sitting at home alone, your company is the television set or the internet, there can be a lot of horror stories that you're reading. And whether they're true or not, the mind doesn't know the difference. Actually, the brain doesn't know the difference. And you know, you could scare yourself. And what does that do? Lower your immune system. It, it starts to make you feel alienated from the world. You start to feel unsafe wherever you are. Uh, nobody needs that. And so I feel like I'm offering an alternative to scaring the daylights out of yourself. Yeah, it's really easy, especially if you're like consuming Fox News on the daily, right? Like to really feel like you are yeah. uh, like you're in fight or flight. And I like that. You know, I got to tell you, being with myself has never been easy for me in the past, which is why I've resorted to drugs and alcohol. And uh, in this, I, I say to people, my quarantine hasn't been difficult for me because when I was in recovery this past year, I quarantined myself. I had to remove myself from people, places and things to not go down that path of addiction drugs and alcohol anymore. So quarantine has been very normal for me, but I know for a lot of people, there's a, you know, it, it can get dark and heavy when we're with the thoughts in our head. And I, I would love to hear from you, you know, for that person, because I know the people listening, either they have a meditation practice or they've started. And then there's also that camp of people that may be like, I don't know how to meditate or I can't sit still, or I have too many thoughts. What is your simple, tangible action that that person who feels like I can't sit still, I can't be with my thoughts, what would you say to them? Well, it isn't always easy to turn your attention inward. And like I said earlier, take time out for a time in and meet your own mind. It is not necessarily easy and it is simple, but I've come up with five essentials and I, and I really urge you, and I'm not trying to promote myself, but I urge you to, to really use these essentials when it comes time to meditate. Um, because Anybody can meditate. I've never met anyone who can't, even people with ADHD and really uh, type A personalities and people who are depressed or suicidal. Listen, everybody can meditate, but if this is what you need. For every meditation, you need three ingredients. Mm -hmm. The first is your gentle, non-judgmental attention. So that's a trick for some people because most people, are attention. they have attention, but it's filled with self-hatred or hating other people or comparing themselves with others or seeing the world with an unfriendly attitude. So just bearing down your attention, un having this attention that might be the same attention you look at the clouds with, instead of judging everything. The Wait, second ingredient, oh, go ahead. I, 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 just, I had to say this because I love that you use the example of the cloud because it's like, I think of it like if I'm looking at a beautiful tree, if I'm looking at running water, you know, just like a beautiful lake. I'm not sitting there judging it. You're just observing it like, oh, that's, and there's no energy around it, right? You're right. most appreciating. I, I love that example. I just wanted to highlight. Well, you know, most of us have an encumbered or conditioned attention. You know, when you look at yourself in the mirror, you get this, whatever, this self-hatred or thinking you're fantastic or whatever. Everybody's got some accompaniment to their bandwidth of attention. So really stripping it down and just noticing, noticing. Mm -hmm. um, even prior to the attention, what you need for meditation is your willingness to give it a shot. Mm -hmm. And that's usually accompanied by some sort of, uh, they call it sankalpa, but some sort of commitment or intention and some or resolve. And what might that be? It could be like, I want to uh, help myself on the path to recovery. It could be, I want to be less lonely. It could be, in my case, it was, I want to feel more love. Uh, it could be that I need to create more peace or get rid of my anxiety or you know, be less depressed. So whatever you meet that meditation with, that is your first thing, your commitment. And you have to stick with the practice in order for any benefits to show up. Mm -hmm. Second ingredient is that gentle, open awareness. The third ingredient for every meditation is what you put your attention on. You can't just magically close your eyes and have nirvana. I mean, it does not work that way. What you do want to do is choose something to put your attention on, whether it's a visual object or a sound object or even a sensation, like the sensation of your breath. Okay, so now that you've got the three ingredients and you can, you can find teachers everywhere who will kind of give you some particular meditation and one size does not fit all and brand names are not any better than actual techniques. So don't fall for the brand name exclusivity trap. Just know you've got, it's natural, you've got everything you need. 
the, the five essentials is really what makes a difference for most people. And here what the, here's what they are. First, it's okay to have thoughts. It's okay that you're sitting here maybe paying attention to your breath or counting your breaths as some people do. And all of a sudden think about uh, what you're gonna have for lunch or figuring out what that noise is outside or think, considering a, a conversation you had earlier. Your job in meditation is to keep on bringing your attention back to whatever it is that you had chosen. Doesn't that, doesn't that help? I mean, that's, I think, what we talked about years ago, years ago in my meditation center. Uh, second, here's a really key, a key element for meditation. Number two, be nice to yourself. Sounds easy. Not everybody is. They say nasty things themselves all day long. And uh, that is really apparent when you sit down to meditate. So knock it off. Third, don't try to have an experience you've read about, like meet your maker, past lives, or your spirit guides, or levitate. Forget all that. They have the direct experience of what you're experiencing. You know, let go of what you're expecting and have the experience you're having. Number four, don't try too hard. If you are a Star Wars fan, you might remember Yoda saying, do or do not, there is no try. There is no try in meditation. It's you and what you're putting your attention on and the unencumbered experience between you, the subject, and that, the object, and just noticing. And eventually, the duality dissipates and you'll be in a little peaceful place, even for a nanosecond. Then you have the thought, what's for lunch? Or I should call that person back. And then you start your meditation again. It doesn't mean you're failing because you get interrupted. So don't try to have, you know, an experience that you're not having. And lastly, uh, stick with the practice. And that goes back to that first thing we talked about, your resolve. If you want to give it a shot for five minutes, do five minutes. Don't stop at three. You know, if you want to do for 10 minutes, don't stop at eight. Do it when it gets difficult. And this is what changes the landscape of your brain. The amygdala, which has been hijacked by this COVID and the news and your own thoughts about your own mortality, um, that is what's going to hijack your attention. It actually makes your attention go from a very wide, expanded awareness to like a periscope searching the world for the enemy. And what we want to do in meditation is activate the prefrontal cortex, the major part of your neocortex, which is the executive functioning of your brain, which will say, hey, wait a minute, you don't have to believe everything you think, number one. Hey, wait a minute, you don't have to believe everything you hear. Hey, wait a minute, maybe there's something more than what meets the eye. It's the executive functioning that's got a handle on things rather than the one hit wonder of the amygdala, which wants to kind of freak you out and set your whole body into some sort of fight or flight response on a regular basis, which is absolutely unsustainable. Okay, there's so much. I love all of it, but two things stuck out. For me, uh, out of those five ingredients, obviously all of them are essential. Yes. Uh, I, and they all, and they all, but like for, I, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, for the people that I know are listening and the first thing, the, the first ingredient, which is it's okay to have thoughts. It's just that permission slip, right? We have a brain, we are going to have a multitude of thoughts going in and it's okay. And I think a lot of times people go in starting meditation, like I'm supposed to be thoughtless and like <laughs> going in with that mentality, setting yourself up for just, I don't want to say failure, but it's just setting yourself up to just be defeated and not stick with the practice. Yeah. So I love, I love that. It's okay to have thoughts. You're going to have thoughts. And, um, you know, I was going to say, while I love to be nice to yourself, I mean, even, even on my voicemail, I say, do something kind for yourself today. I love that because I think it's important that we're gentle. I really love the ingredient of don't try to have an experience. Like, don't manipulate the situation or don't like, so essentially be detached from the outcome. Just the experience is, it just is, right? Yeah, what if, yeah, it works even if you don't think it's working. That's the thing about it. It's working even, it's like going to the gym going, this isn't working, but you know, it, it does work if you're doing it. Same with meditation. Your particular subjective experience does not matter. Objectively, it's working. It's changing the landscape of your brain. It's literally changing the way your brain is operating, increasing the density of the neocortex, decreasing the amygdala's density, literally. And so, you know, about the thoughts though, 
Uh, you're absolutely right. The first thing people do is immediately think they're failing, whether you use that word or not. They think there's something wrong with them. And I can tell you, everybody has thoughts. It's the nature of your mind to think. If you start to meditate and turn your attention inward, you're just going to hear your monologue a little louder. And that's why I say be kind to yourself because a lot of our internal default neural network has a sort of a nasty, to a, a nasty way of being towards ourselves and sometimes toward the world. So, you know, give yourself a break and recognize that it's okay to have thoughts. 60,000 thoughts a day equates to what? One every two seconds or something like that. So you can't magically stop thinking and take it unless you knock yourself out, which is what some people do yeah. who have uh, <laughs> addictions, right? I don't want to hear it. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. Let me just numb myself. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, for, uh, you know, when I think about where I was at when I, my addiction became progress, you know, progressively worse, it, like the more I did it, the more I needed it. Um, and, and that can also go for, you know, the more you meditate, the more you're going to crave that stillness, but it really was running from my, my thoughts and not, and not cultivating a relationship with my mind and with those thoughts and realizing it's not a scary place. If I just give it the attention, not attention, like, focusing in on it but just like really hearing what is my mind trying to say to me what you know and, and so really pa practicing that stillness it's kind of a i think i've been bringing humor into everything not to um lighten it up all the time but just kind of like being easy with ourselves like i, I know my default of my mind i'm like oh of course my mind is gonna go there it's always gonna go to nobody loves me i'm not important <laughs> That's just where my mind goes. My mom, my, you know, my mind always goes to this, this wounded child that's like, but then you spend enough time with your thoughts and you're like, oh, that's just where it goes. Right. It, it, there's no actual truth to it. That's just where it goes. And I know that um, you, you, you've talked a lot about life purpose and a lot of the work that you do and a lot of the interviews that you've done. And I know for people listening, finding their purpose, right? We talk about turning your you know, finding your passion, finding your purpose. Do you think meditation is uh, a tool that we can use, a practice that we can use to find our life purpose? If so, how? Oh, good questions. Okay, first of all, um, I love your self-awareness. That self-awareness of where does my mind go? Mm -hmm. um, because everybody's got a certain affinity. Some people go to the past. I'm a wounded child blaming other people or thinking there's something wrong with them. Other people spend a lot of bandwidth you know, uh, into other people's business. You know, if they're, if they could only change this and I'd be okay. While others really prefer to be in the future and, and just are not here present physically, physically here, but mentally checked out, planning, 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 everything will be okay when. Mm -hmm. And then there are others that say way back when, when life was like this, that was good and now it's not. So we all have our, our uh, affinity, but I love that you, found yours. And I think it's really important to get to know yourself and meditation helps you with that. Also, it will give you this, um, how do I say it? The center point of peace that ultimately is the sanctuary inside you. It's inside you. It's inside every single one of us. It's not particularly located anywhere, uh, or I should say it's not located anywhere in particular, but you will find this centeredness, this stillness over time once you start to meet your own mind and kind of get over the initial roughness of practice, maybe in a week or two, maybe three. Um, and don't meditate for more than 20 minutes twice a day for, for those of you who want to you know, figure it out. Um, I would say once you get to know yourself, you're going to start to notice the yums and the yucks. What is attracting you? What makes you feel good? And I'm not talking about the addictions, but what is it that makes you feel alive and lit up and excites you and curious? And then what is sort of toxic for you? And moving away from the yum, yucks and moving toward the yums and also recognizing um, there's probably something that you do that's uh, uh, maybe a little different than what other people do, whether it's leading a meditation online, whether it's doing a podcast. I mean, we're each unique individuals. We have our own uh, ripple effect. You know, everybody's, well, I want to be like, like Sarah, I want to be like Deepak Chopra. I want to be like Oprah. Well, everybody has their own ripple effect, you know, and you're designed to be that ripple effect in the lives of others around you or on the planet itself. So really notice what turns you on and what turns you off and move towards what turns you on. And I'm not talking about the addictions. I really want to be clear about that. Mm -hmm. I am talking about when you're 
reading something or listening to something. I mean, there are these signs and wonders that will appear and they do. If you can alleviate the stress, if you can remain present, bringing most of the bandwidth of your attention into the present moment and starting to notice like you do, you know, going into the shame or going into the feeling unloved, that's a place you go. It's not present because right now, if I ask you, just do you feel loved? Yeah. See? And, and I got to say this about the signs. Thank you for saying that because that shit's real. The signs are real. But the thing is, how can we see the signs from God or the universe if our mind is so cluttered, right? And so, and please, obviously, because I, I turn to you for this, I, I highly respect the work that you've done. I mean, is it, is it fair to say if we are so in the chaos all the time and we're not still within, how can we really even be present to those signs? And so when we start to meditate and we start to slow down and give ourselves, in, you know, take the time out to, 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 to tune in. What did you say? You said take time out for time in. <laughs> so the time out to time in, then we're going to start being able to distinguish between the yums and the yucks. And hopefully we gravitate more towards the yum. That's the, that's the ultimate goal, right? Like we kind of like, oh, I don't want the yucks. No need to judge it. But then we start to kind of focus more on the yums and then we'll be more open to the yummy signs that are like, we'll be more open to it. Yeah. Just like, uh, I don't know what you read or something you read and you're like, oh, I'm having Sarah on the podcast. Well, you know, there was something where the information on the outside world met your wisdom on the inside world. Not that, you know, I'm the, the best thing in the world, but there was this moment, this spark yeah. that you're like, oh, that's what I want to do next. And that happens for everybody, whether it's, I want to go eat at this restaurant, I want to go call this friend, or I want to Google this thing, or I want to check out this Instagram, or I want to read this book. Just noticing what you're attracted to, noticing what your internal experience is. Meditation helps with that. And it helps you to stay really present because the miracles only occur in the present moment, whether it's this one or this one or this one. And really starting to trust that you are the wise one. Do not outsource your happiness. Do not outsource your wisdom. Do not outsource your personal power. You are the one. And that includes that power of your attention. Do not give it away to what is not worthy. I mean, it is the most valuable currency that you have. It is what's living through you as you. And if you get distracted, if you get hung up in people, toxic drama stuff that people are doing, if you start to notice that your attention is going where you don't want it to go, you're the only one who can bring it back. So nobody talks about this, the power of your attention, but you're the only one who can control how you want to pay it, who you want to pay it to. And then you only have a certain amount of it. So reclaim it from those sort of time wasters. And there's nothing wrong with wasting time or binge watching or any of that. But, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, relationships that are time wasters, projects that are time wasters, you know, bring it back to you, bring it back and go, you know, I only have so much attention. It is the most valuable currency. Think about how it feels if somebody is paying attention to you. What does that feel like inside you? It's, um, th that's a great question. Thank you for asking me that. I, I feel like uh, it, it's new for me because I'm usually paying attention to other people. So I give myself a lot of attention. But when I get that actual attention from somebody, I start to feel giggly on the inside. Like something just, it's like electric. It's like, oh, oh everything's on me. It's like, uh, and it's not in a, oh, look at me in front of the camera like that. It's like presence when someone is actually like, Vasavi, I mean, you want to know the best way to my heart is to ask me how I'm feeling. Just be like, how are you feeling today? Just that attention is like, you know, I, I'm like silly putty. It's so, so Vasavi, how are you feeling today? I love, I, you, this, is, this is clever. I like, okay, I'll tell you how I'm feeling. I feel, um, I'm, I'm very, very proud of myself. Uh, if that's a feeling, I, I am super good. Like I just, I'm, I started taking care of my health. I started working out with a personal trainer. I started getting vegan meals uh, delivered to my house. And I'm like, I feel fucking like on fire. I feel like unstoppable. I'm like, I'm unshakable. And I'm super proud of myself that I, I, have, I have never given up on myself. And that is how I feel. I feel 
very amazing. I, 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 I'm the one with the question for you, but I'm like, now you're asking me and I'm like, I don't know how to put it into words. It's just a feeling. It's like, you know, unfuckwithable. Like, I, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, and you talk about toxic people. Let me just say this. Sometimes the most toxic person in your life is you. Right. So I right. think I, I got that through practicing stillness and being with myself in recovery. I was the toxic person in my life because I was like, shit, I'm sober. I don't have my exes with me, around me. I'm, I'm keeping, I'm going away. And I was like, I'm the negative person right now. So I have to get myself right. You know what right, I mean? Right, like, right. So, but you didn't know that until you took a moment yeah. and to, to started to feel into it. And I feel like, so let's get back to this. Yeah. So attention makes somebody come alive, right? Mm, attention makes that. someone comes alive. It made you come alive. And I just have a quick question. You felt proud of yourself. Where in your body do you feel that? It's all chest area. It's like, oh. uh, it's neck to chest, like this whole heart, in my heart, in my whole yeah. chest. Area. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. So the thing is, attention brings everything alive. Whatever you, imagine that your attention, and this is for everybody, is like a beam and it lights up whatever it's put on. And that's why everybody wants your attention, whether they're trying to get you to buy something or say something or recommend something or like something or share something or give you something, everybody is in search of attention, everybody. Now, what we're, our job is, the attention givers, and everybody's one of those too, is to notice how you pay attention, what, the, what accompanies it, we're back to that bare attention again, what is it that you're accompanying with? Is it love, is it com competition, is it fear, is it peace, is it compassion? I mean, just notice it. I mean, it shouldn't be one way or another, but just notice what's, riding along with that beam and then deciding what you want to pay attention to and you'll bring alive whatever it is and you could do a simple experiment right now with me okay. look around your room wherever you happen to be and look for three items that are the color red there's three items that are the color red you see them okay now here if you're not driving close your eyes for a moment and bring those three items into your mind's eye. And before you open your eyes, bring three items in your room that are the color blue. Don't open your eyes to find them. Just bring it into your mind's eye. And then bring three round items into your eyes, in your mind's eye. Three round items without opening your eyes. Okay. Now, I'm sure red was easy. Now look around your room and look for blue. Was it as easy as red? And does blue pop out now? It does for me. And then how about round? I see all kinds of round shapes in my space. Now, what does this mean? It simply means what you look for, you will find. And not everything that you are looking for is, um, let's put it this way, you just gotta pay attention to what you're looking for. Are you looking for the ways in which life loves you or are you looking for the ways in which you're getting screwed, right? Are you looking for the ways in which uh, you're being supported in your life or are you looking for ways that everybody's competing with you or not giving you what you want? So in general, look for what you want to see. And I'm not saying be Pollyanna and pretending things are all you know, rainbows and puppy dogs, but really start to look, start to notice what you're looking for. Start to notice what you're looking for. And notice the people that are not giving you the attention that you are worthy of. You know, they might talk to you and they're checking their phone or they don't call you back. It's just like noticing the literal exchange of energy. Attention is energy. That's all it is. And there's information that rides along with energy, but attention is energy. Notice those people that are not giving you that. And, uh, Wean them out of your life. Don't give them, don't give it back to them. And it's not worth it for you. It's a, it's a bad deal. It's actually, it's actually uh, like exacerbates, you know, especially if you grew up in a house where maybe you were neglected, you were not given a lot of attention. You're just adding more salt in the wound by attracting people like that. And just, it's just making that wound deeper and deeper. And so I found, you know, this is the reason why I'm a single now is because I'm like, I'm going to give myself everything that I've been seeking from any romantic relationship. And it's come to the point, Sarah, I said this to my mom the other day. I'm very grateful too, because in the Indian culture, it's all about girls needing to be settled and, 
I've been divorced. <laughs> so it's like, got to get remarried. My mom is like, no, no need for relationships right now. And like, what I said to my mom, I go, I think my worst fear, but my greatest desire has come true. I absolutely love being alone. So right. much so that I'm like, I don't, you can't match what I give myself because what I give myself, I have yet to find, or I'm open to somebody giving that to me right now. Cause I can give myself what I want right now. That's where I'm yeah. at. You know, no, so I, I love it. Well, you know, I did that for years cause I was uh, 39 before I, found somebody I could that could match what I needed and uh because I was in one I had you know it becomes familiar how you feel inside it's like oh this feels like home even though it really feels like shit it, um, well home can feel like <laughs> shit but that could feel, oh yeah that's like comfortable for you because feeling like shit is normal but then once you start to sit with yourself and feel better you're like fuck this noise I don't want to feel like shit because you start to feel good when you're by yourself right Please. well I would say marry yourself make vows to yourself and take yourself out on dates, give yourself compliments, treat yourself uh, like the beautiful, loving being that you are. And here's some other advice for anyone who's single out there. When you do start dating, make sure, I mean, it's gonna, sometimes it's rough. It's rough in the beginning when you're trying to navigate the, what's going on. But notice how you feel about yourself when you're with that person. You still feel as good as you do now. And notice how you feel about yourself when you're not with that person. Do you still feel as good about yourself as you do now? So those are just, that's it. It's, it's the measurement of it. Do you feel good with that person about, about yourself? Do you feel good when you're not with that person about yourself? That's just as simple. And so marry yourself, take those vows, like I'll never leave you. Mm. I'll always love you. You know, only you. Uh, all those things. And then um, just start navigating the, navigating relationship with, with self-awareness. How am I doing? Am I outsourcing my happiness? Because if that's the case, it's not a stable way to live. That's like a book title that needs to happen for you. Yeah, I do. That is, that is Please. really, you know, we should like outsource customer service, but we really should not be outsourcing our wisdom and our happiness. That's um, right. And our peace. And our, and our peace. So this is a section uh, that I've been asking everybody. Um, and I'm, I am going to edit this. So like, it's fine if, if there are any hiccups, but um, here's a few questions that I want to ask towards the remainder of our, of our interview. So being that this is the Being Human with Vosity podcast, Sarah, what makes you uniquely human? Wow. You didn't expect that, did you? No, I didn't. I love the unexpected. Um, I think, well, I, I, every human's unique. So that, that's one thing, but I think for me, um, I'm really excited about whatever's going to happen next, whether it's in this moment or a wild question like that. I'm really excited about it. I'm very open. I'm very curious. Um, I'm always ready to be amazed. I'm always ready to connect to people. I feel very open-hearted and open-minded. Um, I'm also willing to ask really tough questions. I have a very deep relationship with um, whatever this animating force is, you know, whether you call it Brahman or you call it God or whether you call it uh, the source. Uh, I feel very connected and feel like I'm being moved in, because of it in ways that I, maybe I wouldn't choose. Um, I also, yeah, I think that's really it. I feel, I'm, I also have at this point in my mind, I don't know if this is really true. I feel fearless in terms of mortality. So. Yes. I love that. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So was there ever a time where you felt like you had to put on a facade and you couldn't show up in your full humanity? Oh. Well, yeah, probably my first on, until I started meditating, until I was about 27, 28. And even in the beginning of meditation, I had these bumper stickers, like it's all good and pretending to be spiritual when I was just like, fuck you. And, um, you know, so at the beginning, I think it was a little rough. And then I realized, wait a minute. And I think Gandhi said this, you know, how what you think and feel and say and do when they're all in alignment, that brings a lot of happiness. And that's really how I am now. And I feel like back to meditation again for me it has been you know most people meditate a little bit i've basically spent my entire life after the age of 26 or so 
in ashrams and monasteries, living in communities, TM communities, Zen centers, and teaching and living the meditative lifestyle. Um, so it's really a part of me. It's not something I just did because it's cool now. It actually was very weird when I started. But I can tell you that it's given me a lot of confidence. Um, it makes me feel like I can really trust the, imp the impulses that come through my body and, and come from my heart. And so I have a lot of fearlessness. I should be saying something right now, but I'm kind of more in awe and I'm just kind of staring at you. So I should probably get on with the, my next question. I'm like, because I feel it. You know what I, what I love about you so much is that I feel when I'm around you, like even though we're virtual right now, like I know that Sarah's showing up and she's just like present and there is power in that presence. Do you know what I mean? Like, and I, and it's years, I don't know how old you are. You don't need to tell me if you don't want to, but years of you meditating and becoming one with yourself and knowing your own duality and doing whatever you have to do every day to become more one with yourself. So you do show up as like, what you see is what you get. And there is power in that, right? Because I can spot insecurity a mile away. I can smell it when someone's like saying one thing, doing another thing. And that rubs off on me in a way. I'm like, oh, I can feel that. It feels a little yucky. So I, your presence is just so beautiful. And you, you know, you didn't wake up like this, like as Beyonce would say, you know, we don't, I, don't, I didn't wake up like this. Like you've worked your ass off on, on so many levels to show up with the power and the presence and the grace that you exude, even through Zoom. Uh, thank you. That's so sweet. But I did, everybody wakes up like this. But then when something happens, yes. you know, we all, we all are born beautiful and innocent and connected. I mean, you've ever looked at a baby in most cases, They'll look you right in the eye and there's no separation. It's like, I'm here. Are you there? Oh. Or more, more likely it's, we here we are, you know? And then the separation starts to occur when they start to recognize that there's them and then there's mommy or the plane or the fire truck or the food. And then this separation starts, but it's still a little bit yummy until about the age eight, age eight when they're out of the, um, uh, the alpha brainwaves and into the beta and then it starts we start to take on our navigation systems you know how do i navigate and make this person happy that person happy how do i get love here how do i get what i want here and so i think we all actually wake up like this or born this way mm -hmm. and then we go through hell a lot of us some of us don't go through hell which is good good for you good karma and then um then we come back to uh being able to be present and love ourselves. And I don't know if it has to do with age. It could because now I'm almost 60. So it could be that, but um, it also could be that I've done some work. And you know, my life is just like yours. I get up just like you. I, I meditate, I get on Zoom or I teach my teachers or I connect with my friends. I go for my beach walk and I go feed my dogs. I mean, I'm not having a, I mean, I live with a meditator, so that's good too. And I'm vegetarian, which is always good, mostly vegan, dairy-free. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I think that that's helpful too. But I also really, I continuously question my thoughts. Like, is that even true? I is love that. <laughs> it makes me think of, you know, how um, a Byron Katie always says, like, is, you know, in, in her work process and the four step, pro I believe it's four steps. And she's like, is this true? And I think constantly asking ourselves that question is the most, is the most powerful thing we can do, right? Because not questioning is what keeps us right where we are, not going after what we want, thinking that we have, like, this is just it. This is just the way things have been done. You know what I mean? <laughs> so not yes. questioning that. Um, so w was there a specific moment when you decided you were done maybe trying to look perfect or good for the outside world and just allow yourself to be human? Um, it's probably a process. Uh, I'm trying to think. I don't remember caring that much about, I'm, I've never been one of those people that spends a lot of time on the external anyway. I probably should do more than I do. I did brush my hair and my teeth for you today and I- Stop, you're great. Put on some <laughs> lipstick. Um, but no, I don't think, um, I don't think there was a particular turning point, but I do want to go back to Byron Katie's work. As you know, I was the director of her schools for a couple of years. Yes. And um, it's the four questions and I'm going to just invite I mean, well, let me tell you what, what my question was. I didn't believe I was lovable. Maybe you have that same thing, uh, especially when the world kind of uh, props that up. You have a lot of proof. You know, I'm not lovable because this happened. I'm not lovable because this happened. So what you look for, you will find if you're looking for proof, 
know that you're not good enough or you're not lovable, there's something wrong with you, you will find it because what you look for, you will find. So when I decided and I started working with her uh, and I started asking those questions, is it true? Can I absolutely know it's true? How do I react when I believe this thought? And I invite all of you to think about how do you react? How do you live with that belief system? Whether there's something wrong with you, you're not lovable, or it's, you'll never be okay. You know, how do you live with that? How do you walk into a room with that? Where do you feel it in your body? And then, you know, you can explore that for a while and then ask the question, who would I be if I could not think that thought? How would I live without this thought? So that's how I live without the thought. You just, I, with the first thing that I think of, and when I think about the people listening, and I think about my own personal life, but it's really, I think about um, women who choose men who are just not giving them what they deserve. And it's like, mm -hmm. I feel if you walk around with that thought that I am not lovable, inevitably you're going to attract somebody that's going to prove you right, that you're not. And you, like, I, I know with that thought, I've, I've always been in relationships with men who have had to overwork myself. Like overworking is like, was my jam. It's like <laughs> being the therapist, I'm a licensed therapist. So I'm being your therapist. I'm being your mom. I'm being your coach. I'm being your lover. I'm being everything. And it's like, but, still, but, but because this thought is constantly perpetuated right in the back of my head, I'm not lovable, then it's like, well, what do I need to do to get that love? And it's just exhaustion. It's it just, is. And I, I, you know, and I speak to so many women like who are going through this. So I'm really happy that you said that because I think much of the grief that we experience in our relationships is probably because you have that thought that you're not lovable. So you've attracted some son of a bitch who's not giving you the love that you deserve. Oh, and it gets really bad. I mean, you know, it, I won't go into my story, but it's, you know, when you get... <laughs> you know, threats on your life or imprisoned, you know, against your will, those are problems. Um, so yeah, asking yourself, who would I be? And here's the thing I didn't mention here. So how do I react when I think the thought, you know, whatever that may be for you, I'm not, I don't deserve it, or I'm too ugly, or I'm too old, or I'm too fat, or all that shit. And then um, asking yourself, well, what do I get to have by believing this? What do I get to have by keeping the thought I'm not lovable, or I'm not good enough or I'm not pretty enough or whatever. What do I get to have? And in most cases, you get to have things like you get to be right. You get to feel sorry for yourself. You get to be separate. You get to, you get to um, be the victim and get, you get maybe have a story you get to keep telling. Uh, there's a lot of benefits that you hang on to with these payoffs, whatever the payoffs may be. I get to be right. I get to be telling everybody what a poor me, you know, mm -hmm. that my relationship's this, and I get to act this way, I get to drink more, I get to whatever, whatever it may be. So really looking at the payoffs, and this requires, uh, this requires a little, um, a settled mind a little bit. This is why meditation is a little bit helpful at this time. So you can settle the nervous system down. So you're able to sit with these questions a little longer than a second. So, who, you know, is it true? Can I absolutely know it's true? How do I live when I believe this thought? What do I get for believing this thought? And who would I be without the thought? How would I walk into a room or a new situation without the thought, I'm ugly? Or without the thought, I'm not good enough? Who, I mean, what freedom? What freedom? That's a mind-blowing question. I think it's really all about the questions that we ask ourselves. Uh, Today, I, I posted on my Instagram, I posted an image that just says, what could go right? Because for all the, I mean, I think about my mom, I love her to death, but she's always thinking about what could go wrong. And I'm like, what if everything just went right? What if it could just go right? I mean, it's so easy to look at the world. And I feel, I really have a lot of empathy for people that think the world is out to get them. And if they try something new, something wrong is going to happen. I'm like, but just imagine in your body, the vibrancy that you would feel or the clarity and just this focus and your creativity would open up. If you just ask yourself that one question, instead of what could go wrong, be like, what is, you know, what could go right? Mm -hmm. Oh my God. Holy shit. A lot could go right. I could get that job. I could, I could make more money or I could do this or I could, I could feel good. And just, I love that. You know, it's about really about asking ourselves that right question 
But when our, ang when our nervous system is amplified, how do we even, you know, we don't even have the wherewithal to ask ourselves those questions. No, because again, back to attention, what you look for, you will find. If you're looking for how things are going right, you're going to find them. If you're looking for ways things are going wrong, you're not going to find them. It's actually Einstein asked that question, you know, is this world a friendly place? Or he usually said, is this universe a friendly place? And it was really about, uh, I extrapolate that to look at the ways in which we see the world. And when there's too much stress in our nervous system from everything, mm -hmm. relationships, roles, responsibilities, food, sleeplessness, when there's stress in our nervous system, and there's tons of that right now, um, you, your ability to see gets very contracted and you're looking for the enemy and that's not sustainable again. And yes, you're looking for what's going wrong because we're wired to save our lives. So we are gonna look for what's going wrong, but it turns this world into an unfriendly place. So you're doing the perfect thing by saying, what could go right? And there's even a, a whole group of people that say things like, uh, how can it get better than this? So I mean, so you could even add that to your, to your questioning. What's going right right now? And that's why I say, if you can survive this, um pandemic with being grateful and appreciative being present being compassionate and here's another one you can practice being content what if you could be happy now what if you could feel contentment with what is going on now i'm not talking about a lack of motivation i'm not talking about chilling out and getting doing bong hits i'm talking about Sitting here in the sense of contentment, Santosha, right? Mm -hmm. Sitting in the sense of contentment. Can you feel content in this moment? In the Buddhist tradition, they talk a lot about the hungry ghosts, you know, these, these ghosts that have tiny little mouths and giant stomachs that are constantly desirous, desirous, desirous. And no matter how much they get to eat, they're never full. And there are people like that. And I know a few of them that are so desirous that even when they get what they want, they're on to the next thing and they're not content. So that's a practice. It's a spiritual practice. It's also a gift of meditation to practice being content. So this question of, um, so, okay, let, I'm gonna back it up for, in a sec, in a, uh, for a second. In the Indian community, right? The one thing that I could not stand growing up is, what do you do? I mean, I, I think it's common in a lot of cultures and stuff, but in the Indian community, like I remember as a, like as a young 20 something year old, I didn't go to an Ivy league at the time. I got my master's in Columbia later on, but I remember as always like, what do you do? Right. And I don't like that question. Cause I feel like you're just trying to put me in a box. And for me, it was always important that I could answer the question for myself. Who am I? Who am I? And the other day, Someone asked me, who am I? They wanted me to introduce myself. I said, well, I'm, I'm a child of God. I'm a kind, loving child of God. I felt a lot of freedom in answering that because what I didn't want to say is, oh, I'm a licensed therapist. I'm a this. These are all my titles. Look at that. And it just felt like box, box, box. And, I'm, and so I'm putting myself in a box and labeled. And so I'm just curious to know, have you, have you through meditation been able, like, how do you answer that question? Who am I? Who am I? Oh, gosh. Um, well, yes, I can answer that question. I would say that I am, I would say I'm love. And you are too. I feel like there's love that lives through me as me, lives through you as you, lives through every single thing. It's not love as a sentiment, it's love as a force and lives through every single thing and it's calling each one of us forth, forth to wake up to it. Um, so I would say that, but that's not always, you know, a cocktail par party talk or it doesn't work necessarily. Um, people, you know, you have to help, you have to be compassionate here and not that you're not, cause I know you are, but you know, give people that sense of safety. Cause if you answer that question, they don't, if I say I'm love, uh, they'd be like, yeah, right. <laughs> She's crazy. So you got to say, well, you know, I've had this experience. I've had this experience. Mm -hmm. So if you, you say, who am I? I've had the experience of doing this and this and this. It helps them feel safe. So we do it because we want to be compassionate. But in general, for each one of us, we should always ask the question, who am I outside of the responsibilities I hold, the relationships I'm in, the roles I play, outside of my age, outside of my weight, outside of how many times I've been married, how many kids I don't or do have, you know, Outside of all of those numbers and letters, and again, external reference points, 
who are we? And you're right on track here. You know, and for those of you who don't know how to answer that question, think about, here's something for you. It's a quickie, ready? Mm -hmm. Think about somebody that you absolutely admire. And uh, it could be someone alive or dead or a fairy tale character. Uh, think of someone you admire and then identify three reasons that you admire them. Three qualities maybe of their personality or their character that you admire them. Thinking about that. Now, Vasavi, without telling me who the person is, what are three qualities of somebody that you admire? Kind, attentive, and consistent. Okay, so um, I would say this is a game called You Spot It, You Got It. So I would say that's how you introduce yourself next time. I love that. I, I, that is brilliant. Did you just come up with that? Well, I, I've thought about it before. Yeah, I'm sure you thought. I was like, that's brilliant. Uh, and, and just so anyone listening want to know, I thought of my father. So. Oh, sweet. Yeah, my father. Yeah, he's, he's great. He's like, so, yeah. When he walks in a room, someone might say, what do you do? So well, I've had this experience, this experience, or this experience. And what do you do? Well, you know, you connect with people or whatever it may be. Um, but then, you know, more importantly, who am I? I'm this, I'm this, and I'm this. And it sounds egoic initially. So you actually just practice a little bit by yourself. But recognizing that's who you are is the most important thing. Not so much saying it out loud unless you're in, a ther in some sort of therapy session or a retreat. But recognizing that, you know, I am kind. And, you know, I am consistent. What was the other one he said? That you think um, you... Attentive. Attentive. Yeah, yeah I would I, say that you're all of that. I always feel seen when I speak to my, I FaceTime him multiple times a day. You know, he's retired. So I, I, we joke, I'm like, you're losing your damn mind. You need something to do. So I like, I FaceTime him. We go on walks together and uh, I'll just be eating a salad and FaceTime him just so we can give him some company, you know? And it's great. Very sweet. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, what does being human mean to you? Well, I think we need to really consider, those of us who are human, that we don't have dominion over everything and that we are interconnected and far beyond um, what we even know. And again, that love that lives through each one of us humans is the same love, it's the same life force that's living through the butterflies and the trees and the bugs and really having reverence for our kin, reverence for all life. Uh, I think that's one thing that we're, you know, we're species. I don't know how to say this exactly, speciesist, mm. uh, where, you know, cows are this and cats are this and dogs are this and bugs are this and rats are this. You know, just because you're born with a bigger brain uh, doesn't make you better. And I think that we need to, uh, I think if there's a saying, you know, to whom much is given, much is expected of. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to live up to the possibilities of our humanity, which include being respectful of all life, recognizing the interconnectedness between ourselves and everyone else, walking lightly on this earth, um, leaving it better than we found it. And um, I think there's a Dakota saying, a Dakota Indian saying that says, you know, you are going to be known by the tracks that you leave. And I really think our humanity, we need to recognize that. We're the only ones that can really recognize that. I mean, there's probably a few animals that know that, but it's really important for us to recognize that we are responsible for the wake that we've created. Don't get me started on uh, animal cruelty and stuff like that. that could, this, con won't. this conversation could have gone, like, could have, I was like, as you were saying, I'm like, this could have gone complete. And it's fine. We could do like a round two. We could just go back anytime. And forth. Yeah, hundred percent. But I, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing so much of yourself. And the, I mean, I love when I learn from people. I'm always kind of, I always want to learn, right? Like I, I want to be a lifelong learner always. And so, you know, for me, even when like having you on here, I respect you so much. I respect what you've gone through. I respect the consistency in which the work that you've done on yourself and the practice that you've instilled in your own life, so you can show up for other people. That is. That's admirable, and I really respect that about you. And I'm so grateful that you've taken the time um, to be on here today. I know you have a ton of resources on your site, and I'm going to link that website uh, okay. on the page. But for somebody listening who's like, all right, 
boom. This Sarah chick gave me the motivation. I need to get started with meditation. I am so scared. I don't know where to begin. What is the, what is like the resource for them that you think, you know what, go oh. to my site and do this. Go I ahead. would go to my YouTube uh, channel right now because I've done so many meditations over the last eight weeks. I'm uploading them every day, a couple, and they're like a conversation um, and a practice and they're all kinds of practices. There's not one all, one size fits all. So just find one you like. Um, some of them are mindfulness, some of them are mantra, some of them are um, Zen practices, some of them are sort of imagination practices, some of them are self-inquiry practices with the questions, who am I? Mm -hmm. So I just invite you to go to that, just uh, Google me, um, Sarah, S-A-R-A-H, McLean, M-C-L-E-A-N, and just go to my website and there's a playlist, I think it's called Alone Together Meditations. I think you'll have some fun there and you don't have to go in any order, just pick one that you kind of get a good vibe from and and then if you don't like it, go to another one. There are about four or five teachers of us on this series. So you might like some other, some more than me. But, um, you know, you cannot fail at meditation. I've never met anyone who can't do it. So I definitely think you should give it a shot for sure. Well, thank and you. So, oh, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I want to say something to you. Yeah. I really admire your consistency. I admire, admire your curiosity and your verve. I admire your willingness to keep showing up even though you've gone through so much and you're transparent. Somebody said to me in, last night, I was on a Zoom call with a friend and um, she's like, well, have you ever really taken a look at your shadow self? And of course I've done a lot of shadow work, but I don't do it so much anymore and probably I should. But I said, you know, I, I'm transparent and transparent people don't cast shadows. And I feel like you're transparent and I love that about you and you're so authentic and consistent and keep going keep going. Thank you so much for being here today, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode on the Being Human with Vasavi podcast. For even more inspiration, motivation, and no BS advice on how to get anything you want in life, book a call with me over at vasavikumar.com. If you love today's episode, be sure to screenshot it and tag me at Hire Vasavi, H-I-G-H-E-R Vasavi. Feeling extra generous? Leave the podcast a positive review on iTunes. And remember this, when you know yourself, you can be, do, and have anything you want.